Hello and welcome to another episode of the Startup Operator Roundup. I'm Roshan Karyapa and I'm Gunjan Saha and together we'll be breaking down the biggest headlines from India's growing startup ecosystem. In this week's episode, we'll be discussing the biggest takeaways from OpenAI Dev Day 2023. Next we'll also talk about the legal drama that has been brewing between Walkme, which is a Israel-based startup, and our very own Watfix. Closer home, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India is proposing the use of blockchain to curb spam and protect user consent. Next, we'll also talk about Instamojo's plan to pivot and shut down its core payments business since RBI rejected its application for payment aggregator license. And along with that, we'll also talk about the success story of Perfios and how they tripled their revenues to become profitable. So a lot of exciting updates to discuss in this week's roundup. Stay tuned. If this is the first time you're tuning into this channel, then please consider subscribing to it for we share regular updates from the India's startup ecosystem. And if you're a returning listener, then do like this video and share it with your friends and let us know in the comments how we perform. Well, before we begin, uh, we hope you had a fantastic Diwali celebration with your friends and family. Uh, Roshan, what did you do? Well, I mean, I saw my friends after quite a long time, actually. Not you. I mean, you, of course, <laughs> I see almost every day. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, Diwali is that uh, special time of the year. People uh, congregate at our house. And uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, sweets, uh, <laughs> a lot of festivities, <laughs> a lot of firecrackers also. Right. It seems like, uh, you know, this year, uh, Millards had uh, sort of conspired to make this Diwali louder, more noisier and more smokier also, I think. Uh, right. Wasn't it just the opposite? Yeah, I mean, I think people, you know, it's uh, people show a middle finger to, you know, authority sometimes. I think <laughs> this was one of those cases, I suppose, right? Um, mm. But in any case, I mean, all green crackers and and whatnot, uh, right? Uh, but but yeah, great time, great time for sure. I mean, this entire this season is a is a time for reflection, um, and it's a time for sweets. Sweet, sweet, sweets. <laughs> you know, Diwali was definitely sweeter because of the the way our boys played against New Zealand. Oh yeah! What a fantastic, fantastic yeah. match! Amazing. I mean, India kind of seems unrivaled in this World Cup. Don't jinx it, please, <laughs> please. Let's not talk about the match anymore. Uh, let's just let's talk about it when it's all over. All right, let's get okay, on with the let's, news. Okay, let's let's get on with the uh, updates. Um. Yeah. So first, I will talk about the big takeaways from OpenAI's Dev Day. But before we dive into the updates, let's take a moment to appreciate just how big OpenAI ChatGPT has become. Mm. I think uh, on November 30th, we'll be coming up on the one-year mark. And in this last 365 days, there are over 2 million developers who are working with the company's tools. Wow. And around 460 of the Fortune 500 companies are using its products. Amazing. But the really big number is on a weekly basis, around 100 million people are using it. That's crazy. That's right? crazy. I think, uh, you know, Facebook took about four years to reach 100 million. WhatsApp, maybe like a year, couple of years, I suppose. Maybe or, or a few months, I suppose. Uh, and OpenAI got there in uh, in weeks, right? Yeah, in a matter yeah. of uh, six to eight weeks, they were already at 100 million users. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's phenomenal, uh, you know, and a few things from the demo also. I think they've launched this GPT-4 Turbo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Why don't you share the other updates? Well, yeah. Um, along with GPT Turbo, they also released versatile capabilities. Mm. Um, they have introduced what's called the Assistant APIs, you know, which is set to revolutionize the entire app development process, since it allows developers to create assistants with specific instructions using the generative AI. Uh, this is uh, this is like a total game changer because if you can train it for context, then it can theoretically work in any different uh, setting, right? I mean, any function, any uh, type of uh, uh, industry and so on, right? And yeah, now, I mean, you might see it uh, more in the service and support related stuff, but it can also move move forward to sales as well. In fact, Sumit himself is uh, uh, sort of uh, enabling that uh, bot that they build to move from support to sales, right? I mean, he will probably have it do a few deal negotiations and whatnot. So, so exciting times. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is absolutely amazing, I would say. Then not only sales, I mean, I think it was Goldman Sachs that announced that it's also going to train, like build a version of GPT f- for themselves uh, with which it will consult large companies. And for them, they'll be charging a million dollars is what well, journalists are reporting. But I yeah. mean, AI is definitely the flavor. That's where yeah. anyway will be a lot of these uh, a lot of these services, right? Wherever you need data um, and you need like amazing context and stuff, right? I mean, data could be the proprietary 
difference between uh, you know your services then in that mm-hmm. case right because i'm sure goldman has a ton a, a treasure trove of proprietary data that they can leverage similarly i mean the likes of mckinsey um, or, or you know some of the other consulting folks um right or audit folks will have all of that data that they can leverage so i think gpt4 just makes it uh, you know um much more easier and accessible to process yeah and you can put that in a process like you said so i mean your junior consultants or what not right i mean i would say you know the teams are going to get a lot more reduced i feel <laughs> yeah well only time will tell but the biggest news um from the dev day was open ai launching its own gpt store which will be going live later this month mm-hmm. uh this store will let users to share and sell their custom built gpt bots and sam altman even says that you know the company will be paying people who build the most useful and the most used gpts amazing a portion of the company's revenue yeah now when i was going through some of the articles online many reporters are calling comparing this moment to the launch of the app store back in 2008 yeah i was just thinking that actually i think because you know it's it's always 10x 100x 1000x better when you democratize your innovation to a wider set of developers right i mean you said 2 million developers are working on it um, they can certainly conceive more ideas more solutions than you know whatever number of people that you know open ai has at this point right uh, so the the great thing that google did the great great thing that apple did was to open up that uh, third party developer ecosystem right and make it profitable for them to build stuff also mm-hmm. so so i think that will be phenomenal yeah. it will be a game changer yeah a lot of game changers <laughs> Well, uh, one one thing, one observation, which I mean, you also touched on it briefly, right? While this uh, development allows anyone to create their own custom bots for GPT, I think what will differentiate among these people is their access to data, like mm-hmm. how much data, what quality of data you're using to train this model or or feed into this model. That is what will be separating the best from the rest. Is what yeah. I feel. Moving on to the next headline: Israel-based startup WalkMe has filed a lawsuit against WhatFix in the US. WalkMe alleges that WhatFix gained unauthorized access to its system to interfere with customer relationships, tried to make misleading advertising claims about its products and use its design mark without permission. WalkMe is seeking damages and an injunction to stop WhatFix from continuing these practices. To this WhatFix has responded of course denying the allegations and said that they are baseless and motivated by WalkMe's fear of losing market share to WhatFix. and in an internal uh, email um, khadim has written that this move by walkme is a result of whatfix's success in the international market and that walkme has a history of resorting to legal action against its competitors now i don't think i have come across a news like this but what does this law so reflect on the broader saas industry no it's fairly common once you get to a certain size where you become significant enough to bother about right i mean that is when people will employ all sorts of methods to sort of come a- come after you um whether it is undercutting you on deals or uh, you know lawsuits and so on right i mean Yeah, you know you look at some of the larger guys whether it's apple samsung google etc i mean they have entire legal departments that are only like doing this full time right i mean uh, defending or suing people uh, so it's just the nature of the game i would say and the allegations are you know i mean it seems very very broad right uh, obviously we don't know the details of you know what has transpired etc uh, but yeah i mean something to expect i would say right i mean walk me is at about 250 million revenue uh, what fix i suppose about 50 60 million at this point of time right uh, and uh, if i was a conventional traditional player in a, a growing industry that is getting disrupted um, right so i i would i would definitely be uh, worried you know mm. uh, so so I think that it also signifies that Watfix has come of age in some sense, uh, and props to them, right? I mean, this entire um, you know seed app category that they built, a digital adoption platform uh, category over the last two or three years, um, they've really helped pioneer a lot of the changes in that. You know, so so yeah, I mean that means that uh, there's something to be reckoned with, I suppose, uh, right? Um, hopefully, the team uh, uh, comes out clear of all the. Uh, clear of all the problems uh, let's see so yeah kind of feels like a scene from uh, silicon valley right when hulu tries to file lawsuits <laughs> against byte piper <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay moving on um, the telecom regulatory authority of india is planning to launch a blockchain platform 
to register user consent and curb spam calls. Now, this is a major move to tackle the issue of unsolicited marketing messages and pesky calls. And uh, Try has taken a lot of significant steps toward this. Now, to ensure the authenticity of user consent and streamline the process, Try has implemented blockchain technology and has implemented what is called the digital consent acquisition process. This blockchain platform will serve as a secure and transparent database, which will be accessible to all telecom operators. Mm. And by employing blockchain technology, Try can verify the user consent accurately, allowing only authorized promotional messages to be sent to customers. Now, all existing consents will expire post the implementation of this platform, which will mean that all other entities will need to uh, seek fresh consent through digital means exclusively. Mm. Now, I kind of feel, I mean, I feel good, but for folks, maybe at Bazaar. You feel Finance, good, but you feel bad. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'm go with the number of calls. I mean, I'm sure you would have faced the number of calls yeah. you get when you, let's say, you're browsing through a web. A, f a financial services aggregator. I'm mm. not taking any names here. As soon as you put in your mobile the number, the number of calls you get. Yeah. No, I mean, for sure, right? I mean, I get three or four calls uh, at a minimum. And this is after blocking tons of numbers, uh, right? And and this, see, this is a use case that should have been solved yesterday by blockchain, uh, right? And, and these are the sort of low-lying, low-hanging fruits that, uh, you know, that blockchain can solve for, right? I mean, because it's, again, very low risk, um, right? I mean, uh, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, validating what spam numbers are, what real numbers are, and so on, right? I mean, I think it's it has to be solved. Um, I really hope that, you know, we all get a higher degree of convenience and uh, comfort because of a lack of these, uh, you know, spam calls and so on, because it's just increased to such a great extent, uh, right? And, uh, yeah, we should not have to like install a true caller or something of that sort, right? I mean, it should be regulated at the telecom authority level itself. Um, so yeah, I think the try has uh, done a good job, I would say. But again, um, if you think about it, when telecom entities, right, like Airtel, Vodafone and all, they launched the DND uh, services, right? Through which, again, the intention was the same. They wanted to curb these uh, spam calls. But, well, of course... Um, Companies are smart. They always add this, I agree to receive marketing and promotional message as a fi very fine print during the sign-up process. What about that? Do you think people will find wo uh, workarounds around, you know, blockchain as well? I think it's different from DND &D in that, you know, there'll be a higher degree of validation here, right? It's a wider base of uh, numbers and contacts that will be verifying whether something is spam or not. Um, right and uh, I, I think it's time man I mean I think this whole DND &D thing happened maybe like five six years back maybe more than that I suppose right uh, and I myself didn't register for DND &D fearing that you know I may not get calls from uh, certain products or companies that I would have actually registered for and were actually important for me right um, but yeah I mean uh, something of this sort is uh, necessary I suppose every once in a while to sort of rehash things uh, and yeah again give up uh, uh, give explicit consent to what products or companies should reach out. I would love for some kind of dashboard to exist where, you know, I just key in my number and I see all of the hundreds of <laughs> products or services or companies that uh, have, uh, you know, access to my number and can also reach out to me, right? And and that central database to sort of uh, solve for, uh, you know, for spam and whatnot, right? I feel like uh, Ranjan of Bureau is doing something similar on the sort, uh, right? More in terms of like fraud and, uh, you know, uh, privacy authentication and so on. So you guys might want to check out uh, Bureau uh, that is solving a similar problem. Yeah. Okay. Now, while this will be implemented primarily for calls and SMSs, it'll be interesting to see whether this will cover the whole uh, area for WhatsApp messaging as well because oh, yeah. a lot of these companies are now moving to, you know, WhatsApp messaging. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. In other news, InstaMojo, which is a very well-known fintech startup, uh, which is even backed by the likes of MasterCard, recently had to shut down its core payments business. This happened because the Reserve Bank of India did not approve their application to work as a licensed payments aggregator. As a result, the company decided to pivot away from payments and explore other lines of businesses. Towards that, it has partnered with Nova Registry to offer more relevant domain names for businesses mm. and also acquired Get Me A Shop, which is a digital commerce platform to strengthen its e-commerce services. 
Now, the central bank in February, this had granted in principle approval to as many as 32 entities to operate as an online payments aggregator. Since then, many more fintech firms have lined up and applied for this license, uh, trying to bring the whole online payment aggregation business in the country within the regulatory fold. But many of them have been denied. And this list includes the likes of Free Charge, which is now operated by Access Bank, uh, PayU, Paytm. So how does InstaMojo's pivot reflect in terms of the larger trends we're seeing in the fintech industry as well as the e-commerce industry? Yeah. So it might hurt their acquisition. I mean, again, you know, I mean, this is a perspective right from the outside. I mean, it could be different. I feel like it might hurt their acquisition. But in any case, everyone kind of acknowledges, right, you know, payments is a tip of the spear. And, you know, the value added services are the real business, right? Hmm. That is where there are any amount of margins to be made. Uh, so InstaMojo for a while has been uh, targeting these small businesses with all kinds of services, right? I mean, whether it is, you know, your merchant storefront or, uh, you know, the other services that you mentioned, right? Uh, so I think, I don't know if it will hurt their, uh, um, if, if it will hurt their margins or, or anything of that sort. Um, and yeah, I mean, I hope that they're able to reapply and fix any kind of compliance regulation issues that they might have potentially had. Um, to get that license right but uh, yeah I mean you know I mean today someone was making the point as to you know why why can't people sell to small businesses right <laughs> because small businesses are really challenging to sell to you know mm. um, they they churn like crazy they're very poor paymasters and they're highly highly demanding right so uh, I really feel that you know businesses like InstaMojo have to uh, have to be applauded further, right? Because, uh, you know, you need these people trying to um, offer quality services, trying to help these folks formalize as mm -hmm. well, right? I mean, the, you know, the mom and pop shops and and uh, the D2C businesses and whatnot, right? I mean, so, so yeah, um, I, I mean, I hope that uh, they're able to resolve things and uh, come out of this stronger. Yeah. Also, uh, I mean, kudos to the founders, right? I mean, they have taken this in a stride and they have, they have not been really try to figure out other walkarounds around it, but rather they decided to pivot and strengthen other verticals of the business. Yeah. And they did make these strategic acquisitions well ahead of time, right? When they knew, okay, here is something which may not work out for us. So let's focus on some other things. Moving on, uh, Perfuse has turned profitable in FY23 after it tripled its revenue. Uh, the revenue from operations increased to 407 crores in FY23, which was mainly driven by software support for loan processing that accounted for 49% of the total operating revenue. It also registered a net profit of 7.8 crores compared to a net loss of 16.8 crores in the previous fiscal and its EBITDA margin stands at 17%. Okay. Perfuse is also planning an IPO as well as an acquisition. They acquired fintech startup Carza Technologies for 600 crores last fiscal and that also significantly contributed to the revenues and profit. They also announced plans to go public in the next 18 to 24 months and have also hired key executives for uh, its IPO preparations. Now, this is fantastic news because Perfios is a key player that has enabled the whole digitalization of Indian BFSI, mm. right? And um, yeah, they made some great um, acquisitions as well, which unlike some other players we know, are actually uh, contributing to the revenue of the company. Um, so what other things that stand out for you from this? Yeah, I think that IPO journey is is key, right? It's very critical because, um, you know, public markets respect one thing and one thing alone, that's profitability, right? Um, so you've, uh, you know, come this far based on potential, based on revenue, but going forward, what will really be important is that profitability. And that is what they're trying to drive towards, right? To get to a significant scale at profits. Um, and, you know, the retail markets are like the pretty uh the the pretty wise about these things right mm -hmm. i mean they're not uh, you can't pull a bull over them right so you can't you know do all of this dress up maybe maybe a quarter maybe you know two quarters or whatever prior to a listing right i mean so uh, it's it's really imperative that uh, companies prepare well in advance for this ipo journey right um, and, and I, you know, Perfios has done that. I mean, they're, they're doing this, you know, supposedly two, two years before they even list. Right. So, uh, yeah, wish them all the best. And, uh, you know, the, we could all have more tech IPOs in the market mm -hmm. really. 
you know i mean that that is uh, really something that everyone should hope for i think right so yeah up next in our talk of the town section we have this article by sanjeev sanyal and akansha arora who write about the boom in indian patents towards that uh, hirak jyoti barua tweets india's ipr ecosystem has seen a remarkable growth with the country now ranking third globally in trademark filing according to the wipi 2023 report patent applications in india have almost doubled from 45444 in 2016-17 to 82805 in 2023 wow. reflecting a surge in innovation but on this i'll also go ahead and say it's not only the surge in innovation that is happening in the country well of course a huge uh, reason for the, for that is the innovation itself but the second thing which has really favored this is also the policy tailwinds which yeah. we are seeing right yeah. the government has really made it easier to file patents as well as brought down the cost significantly yeah no this is the same point that kaushik mudda brought up uh, right i mean kaushik is a founder of ethereal machines and hopefully you guys will uh, hear the podcast uh, pretty soon it should be out uh, maybe in a week or two weeks um, and he brought this up right i mean saying that they have multiple patents and they've been able to file these patents uh, only because of government support right because a mm-hmm. patent with an ipr lawyer and so on and so forth would cost at least a bare minimum of 2 lakhs uh, right and here i'm talking about the bare minimum uh right uh, aside from all of that janjat of like working with a lawyer legal team etc right but uh, uh, now it's come down to a few tens of thousands if uh, i'm not mistaken right so that is a huge imperative for you know people to like file more patents i feel like overall ip has to be respected in india you know hmm. um you know we keep cribbing about where is india building uh, the ip and why are there so many services companies and what not hmm. we have to incentivize people to also go out and build ip right i mean if hmm. just anybody is going to like copy whatever i do uh really what is the incentive to you know build anything new right or even file for ip so i think this is a fantastic fantastic uh, step yeah. yeah by the way i mean sanjeev sanyal's uh, son is an mma fighter apparently <laughs> crazy right i mean father is an economist and you know sons an mma yeah. fighter I but i mean there are any lawyers in the family no, no but uh, his grand uncle sanjeev sanyal's grand uncle was a revolutionary as well uh, right satyendranath sanyal so yeah mm-hmm. bengal had a lot of revolutionary spirit all right now let's discuss um, some of the key fundraisers from these last two weeks Logistics startup Express Bees raised 80 million dollars from Teachers Venture Growth or TVG. Then Zepto has raised 31.25 million dollars from Good Water Capital, Nexus Venture Partners and other angel investors. Medical tech startup Inito raises 6 million dollars in funding round which was led by Fireside Ventures and Bharat Housing Network or BHN raised 125 crores or 15 million dollars from Nab Ventures Fund, Veranium Nextgen Fund, Nine Unicorns and Riverwalk Holdings. Now among this uh, Roshan the Zepto fundraise really stands out to me right mm. because we have been discussing you know the turmoils which companies like Dunzo has been facing right Zepto well of course a very promising startup started by you know a few 19 year old Stanford graduates but at the same time we do know that running this quick service you know uh, quick commerce company is not at all easy there's a lot of burn yeah the margins are extremely low and here zepto is raising i don't know what fundraise this is of there it will be interesting to understand if uh, it is from existing investors and at what valuations they kind of came in right i mean mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> see i mean i've said this before that in 2021 if you thought something was interesting and viable enough to invest at some x value you should think it's a steal at uh, some x by you know x by i don't know x by 2 or x by 3 value right Mm-hmm. which is what uh, you know a lot of these uh, startups have corrected to at this point of time mm-hmm. so yeah i mean it will be interesting to see that um and yeah quick commerce is uh, is a hard 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 business i mean you know raise it in margins very little scope for uh, any kind of uh, you know uh, inefficiencies and what not uh, right but who knows i mean i mean they are uh, perhaps you know adding some sort of innovation to it to you know increase the margins mm-hmm. but you know, let's hope i mean time will tell i suppose but uh, yeah 
uh and express b is raising 80 million is is again interesting right because mm. we keep saying that you know there are no growth rounds happening and which is mm. true i think growth rounds obviously have slowed, slowed down. down yeah but um, yeah good to see a, a 70 million round in the middle of all this 80 million oh 80 million yeah <laughs> shucks all right um so roshan we have few exciting guests lined up well depending on when you're listening to this round up uh, we had a fantastic conversation with koshik mudda who is the co-founder and ceo of ethereal um you know he was one of those guests who spoke really passionately for building not only out of india but building for india as well yeah and uh, yeah i really really enjoyed uh, enjoying the, your conversation with him I mean it was amazing. Uh so Ethereal is building these five axis CNC machines. Um uh, right so think of very very precise manufacturing. So they serve uh, you know industries like healthcare, aerospace, uh and defense and so on, right? Um and uh, you know it's it's been a story of perseverance, right? I mean they've been around for about 10 years now. Mm-hmm. Um have raised very little funding from Bloom I think. um and uh, are finally seeing a lot of success i mean they can't keep up with the demand uh, so kaushik spoke very passionately about this and you know from an india perspective we'll have to start building these hard tech startups right i mean uh, you know the because software will only go so far i would say and uh, hardware is where the real differentiators are right so i think we shall like start cutting metal <laughs> well uh, one um, for me my biggest most not biggest my the most interesting part for me is like why they left out automotive industry which you know we see on nadjo and all they use precision cutting tools mm. but koshik had a very interesting reason why ethereal left out automotive as an industry so folks if you have checked out the episode do let us know in the comments what you think about that reasoning we'd love to hear from you All right so that is it for round up number 134 thank you so much for staying with us right till the end we hope you enjoyed this conversation once again do subscribe to our channel like this video and share it with your friends and uh, network and also do leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform that aside follow us on our social media for regular updates and if you want these updates to be delivered straight into your whatsapp inbox uh do check out the whatsapp link i know you guys hear this a lot of times but guys please follow <laughs> please subscribe and please share uh it really helps us because a lot of times i mean people comment either in uh, you know on youtube or elsewhere that hey i mean this channel deserves more views more subscribers and so on and so forth well you could help us with that right uh so yeah i mean click on subscribe follow whatever right now and send this on whatsapp to a bunch of your folks All right folks so that's it we hope you have a fantastic week ahead and the next round up we'll be back again with more exciting news